Hello everyone. We will be continuing on our um, lecture on the on the Buddhist architecture, the basics of Buddhist and Jain architecture. So the place where we left in the last lecture, that is about the uh, the the use of the trifoil arch and that how that also accommodates the um, this new projection on the top of Buddha's head and that is how this this arch like form that came into um, you know prominence in the in the Buddhist context. So those arch like forms we find to be not only used in the Lomashrishi cave or in some of the sites in Bihar or in Uttar Pradesh in today's states but also in southern, southern parts of India in the Deccan India and so on. So it is believed that I mean Buddha had also travelled to some of the sites of the Deccan and that is how some of the early Viharas and Chaityas were uh, created in those places. So for example, here on screen we have images from the Bhaja caves and that those were also those are today in the in the state of Maharashtra and those were made in the in the second century BC. Now if we see them, these two images that tell us very clearly that I mean how these images, how this these caves were excavated from the living rock structures. So, something that was also in principle of the Buddhist architecture that how to make use of this uh, living architect, I mean living rock structures so that um, uh, no other uh, you know materials are utilized for erecting a house from the scratch. However, we also find that there is a contradiction in this basic idea. In one hand, when we find that I mean Buddha has advocated for simplistic means of living and simplistic ways of building structures. In other hand, when we see the scale of the structures, for example, the Bhaja caves, the then we will also see the Karle caves and so on. The structure, the size, the scale and the precision as well as their um, the details and everything else, they do not really seem uh, simplistic but they are pretty much uh, done with uh, much, much more care. And this is something that we can think that I mean how did this kind of development happen. The first thing first that I mean all these structures even though they are grand structures in their scale and their proportion, but they are not really meant for kings or the royals, but these are meant for worshipping, these are meant for monks and nuns to stay there or gather there during worshipping, during meditation, during education. So those are the reasons these structures are erected. On the other hand, what we also find that I mean during these times like the Satavahana rulers or the other rulers, they will be finding that I mean they have contributed profusely to making this Buddhist uh, prayer halls as well as I mean the places where the monks and nuns could stay. So they have profusely donated to these places for attending spiritual merit. So this also prompted them to make these grand structures which were not really encouraged initially in the Buddhist thoughts. However, those were encouraged further by uh, you know these royals and the wealthy individuals and groups in the societies. So even even here if we see them that I mean what kind of structures those are being uh, implemented, there is this large arched gateway and this arched gateway again is this trifoil arch and the same kind of structure that we have seen in the Lomash Rishi cave in Bihar and this is the structure we are seeing in the state of Maharashtra. So here we also have this excavated structure, rock cut structure that is this trifoil arch arch and it also has those wooden um, supports like I mean the support like forms that we have in the um, this areas we can find how those wooden supports are there like I mean uh, as if they are made of wood but they are actually made of stone. So they only serve the purpose of ornamentation or a reminder of how this architecture were actually uh, inspired by wooden structures. Apart from that they do not really give any kind of integrity or strength to the stone structures. 
So, if this is one of the examples that we find and then in the other example will be the, the Karla caves. So, in both cases we find the Chaitya halls or the halls where uh, people have gathered for worshipping, for meditation as well as there might have also been educational purposes. So, there are some of the cells which will be situated by those Chaitya halls very simple and basic those are the ones which are uh, used by the monks and the nuns for staying there and apart from that all of them would gather in this large Chaitya halls and for this idea of gathering what we find that I mean this Chaitya halls are um, they, they are large in their proportion. So, what all we see in this Chaitya halls, so for example, if we take this example here in the Karla caves again in Maharashtra and that was made sometime between like 2nd century and 1st century BC and the um, 2nd century BC to 1st century AD and then there we find that how some of those ideas about the uh, this trifoil architecture also had prompted them to make much more complexity within the uh, this build structures. So, in, in the cross section of the Karle caves that we find in the right side of the image what we see is the this trifoil arch that is the entrance to this uh, this entire cave or this Shaitya hall and then in the in inside there are rows of columns those columns are also carved from the stone from the living rock structures and the columns also had the uh, this vault like structure on the top of them. So, in a way that the arch like structure had its reputation all along in this hallway. And on the end of the hallway we find there is this uh, structure that we understand as a stupa and this stupa is something that is also very much important in terms of uh, the Buddhist idea of an architecture or the Buddhist idea of the universe. So, how this idea of the stupa that came into being and also that I mean it is something that we see a uh, stupa it basically means a piled up form. Uh, and then a piled up form is something that can be as simple as many stones piled up into a particular form and that, that is that can be considered as a stupa. In that respect we can also think how the dolmens or the megaliths that we have seen in the southern Indian context when we looked into the Indus valley burial practices. Then there also there was this idea of putting the stones together for making a memorial form. So, we can imagine that that kind of uh, memorial practices or funerary practices might have also uh, inspired making stupa which is also a memorial form. Now, how this idea of stupa came into existence? It is believed that when Buddha uh, he he was in Kushinagara and he predicted his death, then after his death, his uh, disciple Ananda had uh, erected the stupa at the site of his um, uh, cremation. So uh, he Buddha also apparently suggested to make a simple stupa at the site of this particular the site of where he is cremated as a, as a reminder of this particular event and then this stupa was also became very much important because his bo bo the bodily remains like I mean his tooth, his uh, remains of the bones and then his ashes and then of course I mean the objects which were used by him those were distributed to people. So, that is the reason this idea of the stupa became very much important as like a repository of Buddha's remains within. So, either the stupa became a repository of this bodily remains of Buddha or the stupa also were erected as a memorial stupa to commemorate Buddha's life and his parinirvana which is like leaving his earthly body. So, those are the reasons why we find that this stupa structure had always been very much important in the Buddhist um, you know in the Buddhist philosophy as well as in the Buddhist art and so on. So, that also relates us to understanding that what all different ways in which Buddhism was perceived and there what kind of debates and what kind of uh, divisions were there in the Buddhist belief. So, 
in the representation of Buddha's body, we find that uh, there were different means in which Buddha's body was depicted. And uh, some of the early uh, historians and art historians have suggested that uh, until the first century AD, there was no representation of Buddha himself and then there were only symbolic representation of Buddha. That is the reason there are many symbols which are depicted in the narrative forms and different other ways which uh, had much significance in Buddha's life. For example, there is this um, the night when Buddha left his royal palace in Kapilvastu and then uh, his, his favorite horse Chandak, he took him to, the, uh, uh, to a river bank and from there he left his material life and embraced asceticism. So that is the reason why we find that the a horse which came back from that particular place to the royal palace with no rider on the top of it, it became a sign of Buddha himself. Uh, such like that, that the Bodhi tree itself also carried much significance and in many cases we find that how Bodhi tree is itself is considered to be a representation of Buddha, a symbolic representation of Buddha. So in the early times, uh, the art historians and historians have suggested that there were only symbolic representation of Buddha and not a bodily representation. However, this idea had also been uh, challenged and we find that that it is not entirely true, but there were different groups of people who had believed in different ways in which Buddha should be represented. Because in the Buddha's lifetime, we already see there are some of the events, for example, the miracle of Shravasti, in which Buddha performed a miracle and he manifested as thousand Buddhas in front of uh, the king Prasenjit. So those are some of the evidences and uh, those are some of the tellings or the narratives which signify that perhaps making the images of Buddha was not really discouraged in the Buddhist thought but those were uh, perhaps been uh, continued by one group of the uh, you know one group of the disciples and the other disciples they stuck to uh, the symbolic representation. So what happens in, in based on this the whether uh, there are the, the symbolic representation or based on how Buddha is represented, we see that there were two dominant groups who made their presence in the Buddhist art and architecture that those will be the Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. So it's not as simplistic as someone who just um, worships Buddha as a symbol and the other one who, ha who worships Buddha as a human being, but it is the idea that in Theravada Buddhism that the idea of Bodhi is much more important than the person himself who had attended Bodhi. That is the reason they believe that I mean Bodhi can be attended by anyone and of course that many other Buddhas have already arrived in the earth and there will be many other Buddhas after Buddha's life as well. So that is the reason the idea of Bodhi, the symbol of Bodhi is much more important than the figure of Buddha itself. That is the reason in the Theravada belief we find mostly in the early development of Theravada, we find that I mean there have been mostly this idea of um, the symbolic representation. But in the Mahayana belief, what, what became much more prominent in the, in the first century and so on. During this times what we find that I mean the Buddha's body is represented, he was represented as a, as a human, human figure. So in the Mahayana belief we find that Buddha himself was uh, considered as a deity, that of course the idea of Bodhi becomes uh, very much important there as well, but the, um, the Buddha himself, Gautama Buddha himself is also worshipped as a deity. So this is the basic difference between the Theravada and the Mahayana Buddhism and then the symbolism and then like I mean the, the bodily representation of Buddha, these two things we also find to be continuing almost uh, hand in hand. So for example, we find some of the early structures, for example, we will be looking at the structure in Barhut and in Sanchi. So here in the left side of the screen, we have the great stupa of Sanchi. And so great stupa of Sanchi, there have been um, a development from the second century uh, BC and the development actually continued until 12th 
century AD. So, it was a long time in which Buddhism was developed and flourished in this site of Sanchi which is around 30 kilometers from the city of Bhopal. And there what we find that uh, this, this symbolic representation of Buddha's body is there as stupa in this early time when the when the Sanchi stupa was first erected. So, in the second century to first century BC. So, in this time what we find to be very important there is that the entire uh, stupa which is basically it is a hemispherical dome, it is a closed structure. So, it is a closed structure that means that within no one can actually enter a stupa and that is the biggest or like I mean the prime uh, difference between stupa and a temple. And what we find there is that I mean how the this closed hemispherical mount that actually came to represent the cosmos or the universe and in uh, as we know that both in the Hindu belief and in Buddhist belief that I mean this idea of the uh, the Brahmanda or like this uh, the cosmic egg that that had already been there. So, this kind of ideas perhaps also prompted the making of this closed architecture architectural form which will be filled with uh, soil or stone and so on and on the top of that there will be stone or brick structures which are uh, you know which are made to uh, flatten this and making into a perfect hemispherical structure. So, this dome structure then uh, we also find to be uh, mounted on a higher platform. So, what we find in this particular image that this is the place which is mounted on a higher platform and the higher platform is something that we can also imagine which signifies the, uh, the importance of a site that we are uh, if there is a spiritual being there is someone who is of much higher importance than the regular human beings we always put them on a higher platform from the ground and that is the reason the stupa is also situated on a higher platform of the ground. And so, there are some of the terms we will come to those terms and um, then on the top of that there is a railing and the railing is erected there for people that so that people could not really go inside the stupa, but they can circumambulate. So, circumambulation is a practice that we find to be prevalent in both Buddhism and in Hinduism where the right arm is usually or the right shoulder is usually kept towards the, the temple or the stupa and then people circumambulate. And this circumambulation is there for showing our respect or dedicating an our best work to the deities and that is how this idea of the circumambulation is um, you know it, it became prominent in, in both these practices. So, to accommodate this circumambulation this uh, protected uh, pathway around the stupa was made on the top of this platform. So, those are some of the various aspects in which we find how the entire stupa became a symbolic representation of Buddha himself and then um, how it also became became part of the Buddhist worship which is very different from if we compare it to how we have seen in the Chaitya hall and so on. Now, in the, in the center of the stupa it is believed that there is a small casket or a small box in which relics of Buddha is kept and that is the reason on the top of this hemispherical mount we find that there is a small area which is again fenced and then there is uh, an area where we find that uh, there are those umbrellas. So, the umbrellas are something that we find those are uh, held on the top of the royals or important individuals. So, there are three umbrellas which signifies that I mean the individuals relics which are resting at the beneath this, this particular structure that is no royal, but I mean they are beyond the royals or the human beings. So, that is what it signifies the divinity of this figure uh, that means uh, Gautama Buddha. So, these are some of the characteristic features of this built structures that we find in the Theravada uh, context. And in the Mahayana context we also find that some of the structures that we have spoken about how that also relates to Buddha's body. So, if the stupa and this relic 
box or the reliquary they come to represent Buddha's uh, body in a much more in a symbolic form. In the Mahayana Buddhism what we find for example the one we have on screen this one this one comes from the northwestern frontier of the Indian subcontinent and that, that comes in today's Pakistan in Gandhara region and that is uh, for, uh, and this is a Gandhara Buddha that was made uh, somewhere between like I mean 4th to 2nd century BC and uh, this one is made from 2nd to 4th century AD and in this one what we find is that how Buddha himself is represented which is part of the Mahayana belief but also we find that I mean he is shown here within a build structure and the build structure consists of uh, pillars which we find this very elaborately carved pillars that we have here. There are two figures which are flanked, uh, uh, which uh, you know Buddha is flanked by these two figures in both sides and they are possibly Indra and Brahma who are believed to have came to greet uh, Buddha after he had attended enlightenment. And then very interestingly on the top of that there is this again this structure which uh, perhaps shows um, evidences of some of those early structures and on the top of that we also find there is a dome like form which represents uh, this, this leaf uh, patterns. The another interesting part of this structure that we find here is this, this archway if you can see it here there is this archway that is represented and this is the particular archway we find with the representation of Buddha which was uh, primed to the Mahayana belief that how Buddha's head was projected after his enlightenment and that is the reason there needed to be this space in the architecture to accommodate this newly formed body that is the reason there was a need for this archway. So here we have the figure of Buddha as well as the archway which came to represent represent this new development in Buddha's body after his enlightenment. These are some of the um, ways in which we find that Buddha's body is represented in the both Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism and how this uh, figurative narration as well as the symbolic representation they they became uh, much more sort of complicated with time and with all these underlying ideas. So from there I wanted to get little more into the symbolic representation and that is what that what we find that in the left side of the image what we see here that is that that comes from another great stupa that is in Bharut in Madhya Pradesh today and that was built between like 1st and 2nd century uh, BC and in this one what we find that there is a veneration of the Bodhi tree. So this particular structure that also shows that how uh, the Bodhi tree that is considered to be uh, of prime importance for the Buddhists that is uh, worshipped here and in this particular image what we see there is this seat there is a seat which perhaps also is the Vajrasana which we have already looked at and this seat is then at, uh, situated at the center of this image and then there are two devotees who are situated in both sides of these images and then there are also other attendants and there is a, a built structure which is made on the top of this place which perhaps uh, shows uh, an early form of the temple complex at Bodh Gaya. However, the temple complex that we see there today is not the same as those early forms. So and then what we see that I mean there is this structure of the tree, the Bodhi tree and that, that actually uh, goes uh, beyond the limits of this uh, architecture to show its mighty presence in this particular relief and then there are other beings for example there are other devotees that we see they are presented here and as well as there are celestial beings for example the Kinnaras, the Gandharvas and all the winged beings, the celestial beings who came to worship the Bodhi tree, this sacred Bodhi tree. So all we can see here is that there are so many of the references to Buddha but Buddha's body is not represented directly. So that is something that we have also spoken about how the Theravada Buddhism that 
uh, prioritized the symbolic representation of Buddha instead of representing Buddha as a human form. So this is something that we find to be very much prevalent in the early development of Buddhism. Now afterwards, we also find that I mean there are some of the things for example, uh, as we have spoken about in the, uh, in the stupa structure. So if here we see the cross section as well as the ground plan of the stupa, some of the things that we have cons uh, discussed already, those will uh, be perhaps much more um, clearer. Now what we have here in the image that we see uh, here is this raised platform and then like I mean uh, which is called the, the stone Vedika and the Vedika that basically means a platform and then on the top of that there is this anda or the dome. So this is the hemispherical dome or the main part of the stupa. On the top of that there is the there is this other Vedika and then there is Harmika or this fencing that and the fencing does not really uh, do any other purpose uh, apart from uh, suggesting that there is someone who is very important resting within this structure. So it is a very symbolic representation and on the top of that there are those uh, chhatras or the umbrellas. Now we see there is also something very interesting that is this axis pillar. So the axis pillar is something that actually runs through this structure and this vertical pillar also is kind of like an axis mundi that, that suggests like I mean what is the center of the universe. So if we consider this hemispherical dome as a representation of the cosmos or the universe, then we know that I mean the center of the universe is the reliquary of Buddha himself or Buddha himself. So in the Buddhist universe, the axis or the center of the universe is Buddha himself. So these are some of the symbolic representation in, those are ingrained in the Theravada belief. And in then what we also find to be interesting is this the railings that is right outside of this stupa that is there for the circumambulation and then slowly when the belief system and the religion got more and more complicated we find that extra railings were added around the uh, you know around the stone Vedika and that is how we find that there is another pathway those that was created around the stupa and here what we see here and then four gateways, gateways were added to four cardinal directions. So four cardinal direction also the how the direction, the axis mundi, then the idea of the cosmos, all of them they came to represent the Buddhist cosmology and um, in a way to like I mean locate ourselves in relation to the center of the universe that is Buddha himself. So this is, these are some of the ways in which we find that the Theravada Buddhism had developed and they left their lasting impression on the making of the architecture. So we will be continuing on this theme and how Mahayana Buddhism and the other aspects they, they have also been very much prevalent in the architecture in the next lectures. Thank you.